awkward here. Oh, there my little button goes. Good evening. Welcome. This is Mel 603. This is week six. Today is Wednesday, June 27th. Um, as always, um, tonight's exceptional about exceptional children's programs, but as always, we will start out with our weekly schedule uh, and see where we were this week. The principal's role in special education services, you were to read chapter seven, and I had seven and seven A, discussion board questions, attend an IEP meeting, um, and then interview the chair of your school's intervention team. This is the school-based committee that receives referrals from teachers. Um, and the reason why I have you do that, we'll, we'll pause here for, for a moment. Um, once a child is referred to your school intervention team, they get the same protections as if they were in, in the exceptional children's program. And you need to understand that. Now, here's, here's the legal part of this. If something goes wrong in the exceptional children's process, there is a case manager, there's a, I, there's a, a EC teacher, there's an EC department chair, there's a compliance technician, a CT, most districts have those. Um, those are all the people, those are the responsible persons in exceptional children if something goes wrong with the head count or, or getting out of compliance on a reevaluation or those kinds of things are not holding an IEP meeting or not following, you know, those, those people are the persons responsible. The school intervention team is what's known legally um, by the state as a school-based committee or SBC. That means the principal is responsible. And usually when there's an, when there's a, um, <clears throat> a school district representative, uh, on on the, that team, that would be a LEA representative, local education agency. That's what the 114 public schools and 70 something public schools in, in, in North and South Carolina, they're known as LEAs, local education agencies. And they have a representative on the, on the IEP team. Um, that person usually is also in charge day-to-day uh, -day operations of the, of the intervention team. Not always, but a lot of times one of the APs is in charge of that kind of stuff. Now, again, I ask you to go to an IEP meeting and I have on the discussion board, I have some questions, who's in charge. The, I, you know, the, the, the EC teacher leads that and uh, the EC department and both at the school level and the district level are responsible for all the things that are supposed to happen. The, the, the EC teacher in your school will also generally be on the intervention team, but they are not responsible. The principal or the designee, which is usually an assistant principal, is responsible to make sure that everything happens as it's supposed to happen. There's a 90-day process <clears throat> that's required by federal law, 30 days of once a child is referred, 30 days of anecdotes, 30 days of the first treatment, or the first interventions and then a, an assessment and either different interventions or the, the same interventions for another 30 days. And at the end of 90 days, a testing decision is made whether to test that child for exceptional uh, children's services. Now, the, the, the problem comes in, or it's not really a problem, but the, 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 the addition to that that comes in that, that, that many school people don't understand is a lot of districts have gone to multi-tiered system of support where there is more that occurs prior to the official 90 days. And you have to know what that more is. And that more is, and is, is the responsibility of the, the local school, the, 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 the principal or assistant principal in charge. And if something goes wrong there, then it comes back on you legally. For example, in the summer of 2014, is that right? Four years ago this summer, 11, CM, 11 principals in a large district in the state got, got either retired, demoted, or, or moved out right before school started in August. 
because it was determined that they were not following <clears throat> the protocol on, on intervention team referrals. Students were being referred in many cases one week and were being uh, tested for EC services the next week. There, were, there was no 90-day intervention process, much less MTSS. The problem was it was racially and, and gender identifiable. Uh, black males were being referred one week and tested the next. Uh, that can't happen. And that's not on the EC department. If that goes wrong, that's, that's the principal and or assistant principal that, that people come looking for. We're going to talk a little more about MTSS and, and the 90-day intervention process, but what I need for you to understand, once a child is referred, they have the same rights and privileges and protections as if they were already in the EC program, and you have to follow through as a school with that 90-day intervention plan, and if your district has adopted MTSS, that's yes. a 30 to 90-day process prior to the official 90-day process. So you need to know what's going on in your district if your district is doing MTSS, and if so, what your responsibility is as a school. Okay. All right, so that's what we were to do this week. Again, you would determine whether your school employs a three-tier intervention system prior to starting. That would be called MT MTSS, multi-tiered system of support, or a three-tiered system. Um, some districts do that, some don't. But you need to know uh, the district that you're working in, whether that's in place or not, because you may be in charge of that, or at least you'll be responsible for it. So that's why I had you do that this week. All right, let's look at where we are. Uh, let's look at where we are with evidence artifacts. Uh, in week six, uh, you're, you're to uh, complete skip task one and, task, and start task two this week. Many of you have already done that. Uh, I've covered the, the skip in depth. Uh, Andrea had a really good question earlier, if you didn't get on the air before we started reporting, uh, about the feedback loop in task three of the skip. That comes from formative assessment. Remember, formative assessment is a fidelity check where you go out and make sure the adults are doing what they're supposed to be doing and implementing these, these short and long-term goals that, that you've set for them in the skip. Um, but that feedback, that critical feedback comes when you go out and talk with them. Uh, as Andrea said, you can do one-legged interviews. Um, but, um, you know, that, that feedback with, from the people implementing these things is critical, and that's where that comes in is informative assessment. So that's why I always have that one in there. So that's what we're doing this week. We're, we're finishing up one and going to two. Um, so please be timely with your work. All right, I'll close that one, and we'll get started. Um, I had a student. Um, her name was Jennifer, and I asked her, she was an EC department chair, uh, she became a compliance technician, I think, while she was in the program, moved up another level to a CT, and I asked her to share with us uh, her biggest 10 concerns about, or, or the 10 things, or 10 concerns, 10 things that you need to know that you need, that you need to be uh, pay most particular attention to in, if, if, as an administrator uh, overseeing an exceptional children's program. And so here's what she told me. Um, 10 million children live with special needs. Uh, I think according to the, the, the family website, I think about 6 million of those um, are now getting services. Um, everybody knows um, education of handicapped children, public law 94142. Uh, she said pay particular attention to page 305 of that law um, for the role of the school administrator. Um, least restrictive environment is what you're always trying to accomplish with children. Um, that doesn't mean that we, that, that 
that everybody gets gets it, it that's that's an individual thing based on the needs of the child that's not a set scale um you know dr pickard's now joined us you know uh if if we both needed ec services what would be might be least restricted for me might not be that for him there what she tried was trying to say is is that that concept of least restrictive is is not just a a rubric it is individual to each child and it's it's more a debate than it is a rubric um you know you have some children who the least restrictive environment is self-contained uh, others they're they're in inclusion model they're in the classroom and somebody just comes by and checks on them but least restrictive environment is not a is not a rubric it's not just a series of choices it's individual specific to a child um, um, ec children have their own set of civil rights uh, it's in the parent handbook that i'm going to show you in a few minutes make sure that you what she's saying is make sure you, you that you know how to access that handbook and, and read and know everything that's in it uh, ida uh, uh, reauthorization in 97 law was amended uh, and so uh, you need to make sure you understand the revisions to, in, in IDA um, <clears throat> IDA does free and appropriate education evaluation was only take place to the extent it helps with student placement and services to be provided uh, IEP will be developed for each EC student both uh, students and parents are encouraged to hold active role in decision-making process in the IEP that's why I ask you to attend the meeting and to tell me how it went who was in charge who participated what happened um, so those are the things I mean this is just kind of a, a, a general um, know these kinds of things uh, so that because that, that but that sets our overarching theme of these are the things that we need to know and understand all right all right so I had a student who did this for me from Cumberland County um, and she said in her district they use response to intervention uh, which is a three-tiered intervention system. Some people call it MTSS, um, where teachers have to do some interventions prior to referring them to the intervention team. Um, I won't go through all of this, but this is, I have it under tonight's lesson and you should read this. Uh, she says, wow, that's a lot, thanks for reading. But the whole notion of a three-tiered intervention system or MTS multi-tiered system of support is that some districts and schools have adopted a whole nother model of interventions prior to being able to refer a child to the official intervention team and starting the 90-day process uh, and what we found is is that if schools on their own their own volition and initiative uh, attempt interventions with students um, many times they don't have to be tested for, for EC that, that some of the strategies work with them prior to the testing occurring. Um, what's important here is you need to know what's going on in your district and your school, and you need to make sure that as part of the administrative team that your school is following through with this three-tier or, or multi-tier system of support prior to the intervention because again <clears throat> that's that responsibility lies with school administration if that's not being carried out um, when the lawsuit comes it won't go well for you um, so both the intervention prior to the 90-day process and the 90-day process school administration is responsible for those things happening in the school once a child is tested in places in exceptional children's services they then assume the responsibility to make sure everything is done correctly with that child 
but then and only then once a child is placed into EC services. Prior to that, whether it's the 30, 60, 90 day inter, uh, tier intervention system or the 90 day official intervention system, those are children have the same rights as if they were already in EC and it's the school's responsibility, the school personnel, the school administration's responsibility to make sure that happens as stated, not the EC department. We have way too many folks walking around who think that everything about interventions and referrals and all that, oh, that, that's, all, that's all the EC department. No, it's not. Until a child is actually tested and placed it in EC, it's the school administration's responsibility to make sure that that child's rights are being upheld. You have to, you're going to know more than you want to know about these kinds of things. And so I won't, I won't beat you to death with them tonight, but you're going to, you're going to learn more than you want to know. Uh, because it's, it's a ever, it's a battle to keep up with all that information and to make sure that all those moving parts are working at all times. You don't want to be the, the principal who uh, doesn't know that folks aren't doing RTI, that are, you know, aren't doing the, the, the tiered system that are, that, that uh, are, moving kids for testing before interventions are put in place. Um, those are civil rights of students uh, and, and those violations will cost you your job. So take a few minutes to read through this one. Again, it's under tonight's lesson. Um, uh, intervention process. So make sure you understand this is prior to the official 90 days. All right. Now, what I was referring to earlier is parent resources. Um, the parent information and resources, I've got the link. Um, it says now more than 6 million children with disabilities receive special education and receive uh, related services in our schools each year. Uh, and they have all the things, uh, they have everything spelled out for parents. <clears throat> you, you can learn as well. Uh, I would suggest that if, that you work your way through each of these sections. Um, you've got terms, you've got parent rights and parent participation, evaluating children. Oh my, I've got preschoolers, modifications, accommodations, supports, uh, behavior issues, effective practice. I mean, they've got a lot of really good stuff here, and so I'm gonna I'm going to go through the 10 basic steps in special education. Um, okay. Um, so this tells you how a child is identified as possibly needing special education. You can parent referrals or child find. Um, and so this, this starts with, this starts with education services, with the testing, child is evaluated, eligibility is decided. This comes after all the interventions have already occurred. That's where the federal law picks up. The federal authorities and with money and resources pick up after, after the multi-tiered system or the three-tiered system has been exhausted, the 90-day intervention uh, process has been exhausted, the child is referred for testing and the child is testing, this is where it picks up. Uh, child is found eligible for services, IEP meeting is scheduled, held and the IEP is written, uh, services are provided, Progress is measured and reported to parents. IEP is reviewed. Child is reavowed. This is a this is about as quick and as simple as it gets right here, folks. Uncle Lamb, can I can I comment? Yes, sir. Okay, folks. On step six, uh, when the IEP is being is written, one of your responsibilities will become probably an LEA rep because you'll yes. be representing the LEA from that standpoint as an assistant principal in most cases. Mm -hmm. Folks, uh, there's a story that I can relate to you where he had a, a new assistant principal who was uh, to attend all the IEP meetings. That was her responsibility. Well, one day there was an IEP meeting that was scheduled. Uh, she decided uh, that something else was more important. 
Uh, she didn't show up. Matter of fact, she wasn't even to school. Uh, she met with the EC teacher the next day and signed the form. <laughs> uh, it did not take long to circulate back to the principal, who also referred to the superintendent, and that AP was fired. Yes. Spot. Yes. So don't don't assume, folks. You I know that sounds like that's a, that's a, a a common sense thing that you know to be there, but uh, evidently uh, there was in this this situation the AP who was new. Uh, didn't take her job seriously and uh, signed the IEP after the meeting was over. That will get you fired in a heartbeat. So I just wanted to comment on that, Dr. Lamb, while you were in that category. Yes. As, as I, thank you, Doctor, for amplifying that, Dr. Picker. Please remember, um, you're going to get all the worst jobs as the new AP. <laughs> uh, you're going to get all the worst jobs. Um, you're going to get bus duty in the winter time. Get your long coat. Make sure it covers you behind. Pardon, pardon me for being a little crude. But, uh, that's what we call a bus duty coat. Get your umbrella. You, you, you're going to, you, uh, you're going to get bus duty in the worst weather. You, you're going to, you're going to get this. You're going to get, you're going to get LEA rep on I, everything that, that nobody else wants to do. And the people who have seniority before you, um, that's kind of a time honored tradition in our business. All the worst jobs go to the new person, um, whether you're ready for them or not, or whether you're actually good at them or not, it's immaterial. We call that building character. That's right. Nobody <laughs> wants to do these things. And that's why I told you, I, you know, my job this semester is to point out all the things that you're going to have to do as a new AP, all the dirty jobs that nobody else wants to do. Um, and they're the ones that get you fired the quickest if you get them wrong. That's unfortunate, but that's, you know, it, it is, uh, it's a character builder, but it's also an IQ test. Are you smart enough to know what's important? Um, you know, I was, <coughs> I was thinking back today, actually, um, I was reading through one of, one of the, the OMAs that came in today and, um, the, uh, the, the candidate was talking about their school, um, and whose job it was to do this, that, and the other. Uh, and it was not a public school. It was a charter school. And I, when I read through it, I thought, well, see, not that much different than public school. Cause they had, you know, the new people, uh, they, they had them doing the dirtiest jobs, the things that nobody else wanted to do. And I thought, well, see that, that just doesn't change no matter what, whether it's a private school, a public school, a charter school, which is a form of public school, doesn't matter. When you get your first job as an AP, you're going to be on the lowest rung. Uh, and you're going to be the low-hanging fruit, the easiest to knock off. They're going to give you the jobs that nobody else wants uh, because of the danger associated with them to your career. Um, you've got to be smart enough to know you can't skip an IEP meeting and sign the form the next day. Uh, the whole idea is that you be there and be represented. And if you do something like that, you know, you're going to lose your job. That's, that's very simple, but you need to read through this again, this, this, this website that I've got linked to, to tonight, this is once a child is ready for or, or has been evaluated and is getting services. That's where this picks up. Don't confuse this with the intervention process. Um, Multi-tiered, three-tiered, and then the 90-day uh, intervention process behind that. Uh, then we start here. This is the next step. Once it gets to here, you still have some responsibilities, as Dr. Picker just pointed out. You still got to attend the IEP meetings. You still got a role that you have to do as the LEA rep once it gets to here. Um, don't, don't think that, well, whew, we got, you know, we got this kid through the intervention process. You know, I'm done with him now. No. Uh, you, if you're the LEA rep, you still have responsibilities. Um, but if you drop the ball anywhere along the way during the intervention process, the, the MTSS or three-tiered uh, or the 90-day official process, or once the kid you know, has an IEP, if you drop the ball, um, it, it's not a good thing. 
uh, it won't go well for your career. So again, I have this link to parent information and resources, and it's the best place to start because it explains it in terms that you can understand. Now there's some handbooks for professionals. They're a lot more involved, they're, they're thicker. Uh, I always suggest that as a beginner that you start with this one. Then you can go to DPI's website that has all kinds of links to all the official federal documents. You saw, I was referring to, 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 to EC law a few minutes ago and, and made a reference to page 305. That wasn't a joke. Uh, and that's not near the end either. Um, this will summarize it for you and kind of get your feet on the ground. Uh, and as I said, that young lady in, in Cumberland County that did that one for me kind of explained the, 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 the intervention system. Um, you need to find out. That's why I said interview your intervention person. You know, what, what does your school do? Do you just do the standard 90 day intervention that's required or do you have a tier system that, that precedes that? You need to know that um, because that may be what you're involved with once you get your job. So here's the parent handbook. It's very important. Let me close a couple of these documents. Okay. Let me go back here. FERPA. All right. I know you've heard of FERPA before. Um, <coughs> first thing students ask me, well, what does FERPA stand for? Well, it's Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. Um, and it's basically how you have to handle sensitive and material information information and materials and documents uh, around student records. Uh, it will be most relevant for, for students who are in the intervention process and students who are, who are uh, in your exceptional children's program, but, it, but it, it's the same for every child in your building. It's just most relevant with those. Rarely do records come up with other children, but they come up all the time. Uh, assessment and records come up all the time with students who are involved in the intervention process and who are in the exceptional children's program. That's where you're most likely to be handling sensitive information uh, about a student is, is during one of those two processes. And that's why I've got FERPA here and, and it tells you um, what access you must provide to educational records to the student and parents. Um, amendment of educational rec disclosure of records, what, who, who you can talk to, who you can release information to, all those things here. Um, you can't, you can't give out personally identifiable information. Um, but here are all the rules, annual notification rights, uh, law enforcement records, uh, complaints of alleged failures to comply with FERPA, uh, complaints regarding access, complaint regarding amendment, complaints. So this will summarize it again. If you read the whole thing, you know, it's several hundred pages, but here again is a key summary of the FERPA law. Uh, this is one of those things for your toolbox, just like that parent information website I just showed you. These are shortcuts. This gives you the big picture, the big idea. Um, you say, well, that's not too short. Well, shoot, that's only three, two or three pages. Uh, if you go to the law, it's several hundred pages. And so this is a good one to have that will summarize how you handle. Now, most of the time we don't just hand out information over the counter to anybody that comes by. Um, a lot of times we, we don't, um, we're, we're very careful about records. Um, you know, we need to keep them in lock cabinets. The problem comes like when students are moving from one building to the other, like they're moving from the fifth grade to a middle school or from a middle school to a high school. One of the things that I walked into, a, I guess it was a junior high school when I was a junior high principal. 
I walked into a junior high school and all the folders were stacked up out in the hallway. All the folders were stacked up out in the hallway waiting for uh, the courier to come by to get them, to take them from Eastway to Garinger High School, from the junior high to the senior high. We had senior highs back in those days. It's before I was a senior high principal. And, and I walked in and I was like, well, why are all these, why are all these cumulative, Dr. Picker remembers, we had, we called them cumulative folders. They were manila, big manila folders. And they weren't even in boxes. They were just stacked up on a table out in the hallway. Um, just for anybody to, to come by and pick one up and peruse through it all that they wanted to. They're just sitting in the hallway. And I said, well, I said, well, the courier's going to come by and get those at some point. Um, I said, you know, uh, they're going to fire you and they're just going to fire me for knowing you. Uh, um, this is, this is not going to go well. You can't leave people's cumulative folders just sitting out in the open. Those things are supposed to be under lock and key. Well, it's just, you know, the guidance counselor is going on vacation and she didn't want to have to come back and be bothered to get these things. So she just went ahead and stacked them out on this table out in the hallway. Um, I don't know. She was probably a nice lady, but I told them that they could find her another place. She could just report somewhere else in the fall of the year that I couldn't use her anymore. Um, that somebody that would be that careless, she would get me fired. Um, seriously. Um, you just can't do things like that with records. Um, I was at a public separate school that I had to supervise when I was in the central office. Um, I had two public separates. I, I, I was not in an area office. I was in the central administration. Um, and so I had to supervise all schools, um, but more particularly I, the public separates. I had to, to, to be uh, what would be loosely referred to as exceptional children's schools that were, that were only for exceptional children. We had two of those in the district, public separates, and I had to supervise them. And I came in to do an audit one day um, to make sure everything was, you know, was as it was supposed to be. And, and I heard this lady and she was much like myself, kind of loud and her voice carried. And she was in the lounge discussing one of the children. And so I had to, I had to go and, and, and get the principal right quick and said, you know, whoever this lady is, obviously she works here. Uh, you need to send her back to wherever her workstation is, but, you need to remind her that we don't talk about children. Every child in this building is an exceptional ch child. It's a public separate school. She can't be talking out in a, in a public area about, about these children in any way. Um, because she is talking about things about their placement or their, their disability. Uh, it, you know, anybody could be walking in this building and hear this. Um, the, you know, by very virtue of being in this building, every child here is an exceptional child and has an extra level of, of further protection because of their, of their status. We, we just can't have this. Um, the person was a, a lunch assistant, teacher assistant for lunch. Uh, this was, again, a public separate where all the children were severe and profoundly mentally and physically handicapped. Um, and so they had... They had uh, hired people who would come in and be assistants for so many hours a day. Uh, and she had arrived early and was camped out in the lounge, uh, holding, holding court in the lounge. We, we, can't, we can't have that ever again. Um, we can probably do without her. Uh, you know, as soon as we can replace her, we'll need to. Um, there's just certain things that the liability is just too great, just like, Dr. Pickard was talking about the school district, the principal, nor the school district wanted to accept the liability of a person not showing up at an IEP meeting, which is a violation of federal law, and then signing again, you know, a fraud, you know, create, <clears throat> committing a fraudulent act by signing it the next day as if she had been there. Uh, we we can't we 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 cannot accept that kind of liability. Uh, with federal programs. And so if you get this wrong, it, it's a, it's an ender for you. So, um, but this is a good one to make sure that you know what the law is. Um, 
Let me see where I am. All right, I think I've covered everything up to this PowerPoint. Now, <clears throat> for the purposes of this PowerPoint, um, mainstreaming is the old version of exceptional children's programs um, where you had self-contained or you had EC classrooms, inclusion being the modern model where the child goes to the regular class and the EC teacher comes to that class um, and, and works with that child there. Um, and so now I have some folks who will say to me, but Dale, the inclusion model uh, doesn't work as well as, as the old mainstreaming model. And to which I respond, <clears throat> duh. Uh, it, the inclusion model was not designed to work better. Um, it goes back to two things. Least restrictive environment, number one. But number two <clears throat> is it's a cost savings of 30%. Let me say that again. It's a cost savings of 30% to run the inclusion model over the old traditional mainstreaming model. And so technically it does meet the, the federal requirements. Um, and so um, I won't argue that students don't get the same. Um, I won't argue that they get less. Uh, what I will, well, what I will acknowledge is, is it costs less, and that's the reason why we do it. I have people all the time tell me it doesn't work near as well. Well, that's not the point. They didn't put it in so that, that it would work as well or or better. They put it in to save money because it follows the letter of the law. Now, I said that to say this: you're going to get a lot of parents <clears throat> uh, who have strong feelings either way. You're going to get some parents who want their child to be able to go to the regular classroom that should not be in the regular classroom. That's not the least restrictive environment for them uh, and them be successful. And then you're going to get other parents who say, my child's not getting what they need through this system. So what has happened with the inclusion model, unfortunately, is, is we're getting hit on both sides, you know, and each year on both sides of the head. The parents who are angry that, <clears throat> that their child should be able to go to the regular class. Now the other children are getting to go. I should get, mine should get to go too. But your child, that, that's not an appropriate setting for your child. Your child, you know, is, is more severe than that. Um, and then you get beat up by the parents who say, I'm not getting what I'm supposed to be getting. My, my child's not getting, getting enough attention. That teacher only comes by for a few minutes every other day or, you know, you know, and she's got three or four other students she sees in there. I want my child in a room with that teacher all the time. My child's not advancing. So, unfortunately, um, the inclusion model has, has caused a, a lot of, of pain and strife for school administrators. I won't get into the delivery. I'm sure there's some great EC teachers that go into classrooms and do a great job. That's not my argument. What I'm telling you is, from an administrative perspective, uh, you're going to get <laughs> you're going to get hit from both directions, and so it would behoove you to look at this PowerPoint. Um, I've got some good things in here that might give you some you know some talking points, some things for you to understand better, so that you could engage in a conversation with these irate parents and maybe provide them some information or maybe a point of view that they hadn't seen before. That's the point of this, of this PowerPoint is, is that, yes, I know you're getting kicked in both shins as school administrators. Yes, you are. I get that. Uh, this might offer you a little bit of relief on that. So as we work through this, it kind of gives you, you know, this, it starts with a definition. So you understand, um, and, uh, kind of gives you the differences, the similarities and the differences of, of, of the two programs. Again, talking points um, uh, all the way through, kind of explains it. Uh, 
uh, it's a controversial concept. Now, now I'm going to deviate off of uh, you know the, the the PowerPoint here for just a minute. I'm going to pick up on this one. One of the reasons why inclusion is has become so controversial is um, student placement. Everybody wants their child to be placed autistic now. The reason why the numbers of autistic, of, of identified autistic children has, has exploded over the last 10 years is, is there's not nearly the stigma attached to autism as there is in uh, mental retardation or mental disability. Let me say that again. There's not the stigma attached to autism that there is with mental disabilities. And so it, parents lobby very hard for their children to be placed autistic. Um, the problem is they're not autistic. They're mentally disabled. And when you put those children in the regular classroom, um, that is a problem. And that's where the controversy erupts. Um, just from, you know, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but just anecdotally, I would guess that the majority of students placed autistic are not actually autistic. Uh, if you read a strict definition of autism, child has to be a has to be at or well above or above normal intelligence. The problem is is we're placing kids with mental disabilities with IQs um, below 85 as autistic. By definition, those are not autistic children. Um, you know, it, that that's where the real conflict comes in with inclusion. If if we put if we put kids if if we put kids that in in may in in regular classes and got them some help that needed to be there, what we used to call the learning disabled kids that that that, that there was just a gap between <clears throat> between their intelligence and their achievement, uh, we'd be fine but we put all these autistic kids who are really our, you know, at one time would have been SLD or, you know, uh, severely uh, or mentally, you know, EMR or EMD, uh, all, all those old categories of kids that had below 85 IQs. Uh, we're putting those in regular classes now as well. Labeling them autistic and put them in, in regular classes. Oh, folks. That's trouble, I'm telling you. But now, I'm not telling you you can fix that. I'm telling you that that's what's going to happen to you, and you better be prepared for it. Hopefully, this PowerPoint will give you some primers, some tips, some, some things. Now, it's a long one. It's 63 slides long, but it has a lot of information in it. But this is another one of those tool chest things that when you get your job um, and you start having problems, questions, complaints about um, – from EC parents over the inclusion model at your school, this would be a good thing to review. Um, but again, from what I have seen, the data that I have collected, what I have seen, our biggest problem right now with the inclusion model is, is we're labeling kids as autistic, which makes them eligible to go out into regular classrooms and just receive services in classrooms. Oh my, and those children just cannot can cannot that it, that is not a good environment for them, and so in 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 reality, it's you know inclusion only really works when the proper students uh, are are in the program. But right now, um, the the hot thing to do is just label every child as autistic. It makes parents happy, and they they, they quit kicking you in the shin every day if you do that. But but. A lot of those kids are just not autistic. They do not have above average intelligence. Dr. Lamb. Yes. Kent, is it okay? Like some stu I know some districts, well, some schools, they have the autism kids, but they are considered self-contained. They don't go into the regular ed classroom. <laughs> See that, that, thank you for bringing that up. That, that's, that's a lot of districts are offering that as a solution now. Well, go ahead and label your child as autistic, but they're going to stay self-contained as if they were educationally mentally handicapped. That's what 
Certainly. Yeah, that that's what a lot of districts are doing now um, in order to, to 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 try to get around this problem that I am telling you of. Uh, so when we first started placing all these kids as autistic, what that meant, parents thought, well, that means that they get to go back to regular classes. Oh, what a disaster that is. Uh, so they're going ahead and labeling them as autistic, but keeping them self-contained. That, that is the solution. Now, parents don't like that as well. But, you know, I didn't like it when my hair fell out either. You just have to grow up and go on about your business. You just have to be a grown person. And that's what you have to tell parents sometimes. You know, this is how it has to be. You know, we have, you know, we have labeled your child as you want your child to be labeled. Um, you know, back in my day, and Dr. And Dr. Pickard remembers this too. Back in, when, in our early days, the category that we had that everybody wanted their child labeled as before autism came along was OHI, other health impaired. Uh, that was the one that, so that it, it didn't appear that your child was mentally handicapped or special ed, they all wanted the OHI dis designation. Well, OHI has now become autism. Uh, but you're exactly right, Pam. That that's that's the that's the right thing to do is label them, but then keep them self-contained. That solves a lot of problems. That's pretty smart. Um, are there some children for whom inclusion? That's exactly what we're talking about. Um, I don't care what you label them, but they need to be in the right place. But see, parents want them labeled autistic. Um, because it doesn't look as bad, but then, then they forget their child, their, their child is really low. And so, oh, if he, if we've labeled him autistic, well, then that means he can be in the regular room. Well, that doesn't, you know, that label doesn't make your kid any smarter. Unfortunately, you have to say it in a more pleasant way than that. You know, you know, I mean, you know, um, you know, you have to, you have to bite your tongue sometimes. I mean, I know you want to want to say bad things, but you can't, um, you know. And so, um, you know, that's that again. That th this is the crux of the argument. Um, and then I've got some some folks who advocate on both sides. Um, some information that will help you, hopefully. Um, with references back to um, some uh, some older stuff, but it's still the uh, again um, it, it's it's the current law uh, IDA two thousand four does not require inclusion. Um, it is not required, but it's uh, so. Really, parents can't force you to do that. You just have to be strong in your conviction. But I have all the relevant laws here for you. I have all the relevant argue, arguments and ideas so that you'll know both sides. You should be prepared. I've got all these things, 504. It's all here. Uh, it'll take you a little while to work through it. But again, this is a shortcut. This kind of puts it all together for you. So, you know, to, to, you know we're heading toward the benediction here. Um, as we get toward the end, I've got websites. I've got the, the parent website that will give you a very good primer on, on EC. We've got the, we've got all the, the intervention things there, the, the a rough outline of an intervention, a tiered intervention system. You should do that. I've got the, the, the FERPA website where it's all summarized for you in terms of, of, of handling data and information for exceptional children. All, all of it's here. Um, hopefully, when you get your job, you will have the, this will be there for you. But as Dr. Pickard pointed out, you'll get this job. Uh, and, and that's a good thing uh, because you'll have a job. But if you do it wrong, you won't, as he pointed out, you won't have one. You know, my job every week is to keep you out of jail, not lose your house. Uh, that, that, that's why we, that, that's kind of the, the notion every week is, is, I wish I could teach law and finance from perspective of, uh, of, of a positive note, but unfortunately, um, that's, that's not the case. Um, uh, 
everybody's looking everybody's looking to blame somebody somebody else's fault scapegoat somebody else all the time don't be that person that that, that is at the end of the line uh, that bad things happen to we want you to do an excellent job when you get out there we want you to be a leader and and be proactive but you need to learn this stuff to protect yourself along the way i see my time is up so dr I liam <clears throat> can i step in here just a minute <clears throat> Yes, sir. Folks, uh, once uh, you take on the LEA rep, uh, <clears throat> once the IPs are written and modifications are, are woven throughout the, uh, uh, the IEP, uh, you've got to monitor to make sure <clears throat> those modifications are implemented and the student's becoming successful. Excuse me. <clears throat> I had a situation with an eighth grade student one time when I was AP to middle school, a uh, student was failing math and he was, he had an IEP with uh, modifications for math. And I went to the teacher and uh, I asked her about that. And she, uh, she said, Oh, I don't follow his, I, I don't follow his modifications. It takes too much time. <laughs> uh, that's, <clears throat> I couldn't believe she said that uh, because this was a veteran teacher. Evidently she'd gotten away with it before, but uh, uh, I made it real clear to her that uh, she, that by law, she had to file that IEP without, uh, without any, <clears throat> any changes. She had to file an IEP to the letter and those modifications had to be implemented in her classroom, uh, reduced problems, more time on problems, yada, yada, yada. So uh, she didn't like it, but uh, I had the support of the administration, which didn't need it, but uh, cause it's federal law. Yes. But you've got to monitor Folks, you've got to make sure you monitor the, the, the modifications and the, and the students are being successful. Uh, <clears throat> that the, I hate to use this term because I've been told it was wrong, but level the playing field. But you've got to make sure these students are being successful and the uh, IEP is being followed by all teachers that have these particular students. And you're going to have to monitor this. Uh, you can't always assume that the teacher is doing what they're supposed to do like I did. I was new AP at that time, and I just assumed, you know, what that does, what that does for you. Uh, the teachers, all teachers were following it. And when I found out a student was failing, uh, found out a teacher was not following that, then we had to do an about phase. So make sure that once you take on this LEA rep uh, you, and you follow everything that Dr. Lamb shared with you tonight, make sure that once this uh, becomes active, that the, the modifications are being followed as required by law. That's, that's your job as LEA rep is to make sure that IEP is being followed. Um, and that's why you can't skip the meeting. Because <laughs> um, uh, that's the whole point of uh, you're supposed to be at the meeting. Uh, and you're supposed to follow up and make sure that that thing's being implemented as written. Um, and you're supposed to have input on that as well because you're the one that has to, you're the one that has to enforce the implementation. So you, you need to be there when it's being written um, so that you know and have input as to what's written into that IEP. Um, Dr. Picker, Dr. Lamb, you said the LEA is responsible for that. Is there ever a case where they expect the case manager to be the person that's going into the regular ed teacher's classroom and consulting with them quarterly to make sure that the accommodations and modifications are being implemented? Well, well, that's that's another backup. That's just yeah. another, that's another backup, which is really a good thing to have. Uh, but don't always assume the case manager is going to stay on top of this because she probably has other schools. Uh, you know, and in one case, I know a case manager had two schools. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't assume that the case manager is on top of all this. So basically, you as an LEA rep and the case manager should parallel your should parallel your monitoring process. But uh, yeah, that would be a part of it. But yeah, you can't assume because the case manager is there that he or she is on top of that. You need to also do your own monitoring. Well, from my experience, I worked in four, four public school districts in my, my career. From my experience, even, even when you have case managers or compliance technicians, CTs, same thing, tomato, tomato. <laughs> what I found with them was is that they were about the paperwork. 
that, that their job boiled down to making sure that all the paperwork got shuffled and filed on time and that I never knew one that went into the actual teacher's classroom and made sure that the modifications that were being carried out. They were just, as, as you pointed out, they were a lot of times I have one CT that was at four schools. Um, you know, they, all she did was paperwork, make sure that everything, that all the reavows got done on time, you know, uh, the um, behavior intervention plan. It was all about the paperwork. That's all she did. She never, she never, and she wasn't there for meetings. I mean, that's why you have an LEA rep. It's important to be at the meeting. I don't want to keep, I can't, un, I can't overstate the importance when, when, you're, when you're working through an IEP, for those of you who, who have done that, a, a lot of it is give and take in terms of what's, what's, reason, what's a reasonable expectation for follow-up and follow-through. And that's why the LEA rep is there, because they're the person that's going to have to do that follow-up and follow-through. Uh, I mean, if you're not there, they might write something in like, well, the assistant principal's going to drop in every 15 minutes and make sure Jimmy's doing okay. Well, if you're not there to object, well, I'll just write that down. Nobody else cares because they're not the assistant principal. <laughs> it means they won't have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to make sure as LEA rep that you're there because you are you are the person who's going to have to follow through on the practical part of it. The case manager and the CT, they're just going to do the paperwork. I'm sorry. If somebody here tonight is a case manager or a CT and you do more than that, thank you for that. But if you're also, if you're that person, if you're that guy or gal, you know that it's all about the paperwork for you. That the LEA rep is the person who actually has to go out and make sure that the services are being delivered as, as written. So you better be there when they're written. Otherwise, they'll write things in that cost your district money and your district will come back to you and say, who's going to pay for this? Well, it's in the IEP. You do. Well, how, how did it get in the IEP? You weren't supposed to do that. Well, I wasn't there. I had a hair appointment. <laughs> <laughs> I have those quite frequently, as you can see. And so, seriously, I mean, I've had I've had people not show up and things like homebound homebound services getting written in an IAP, and there was no money for homebound. And the district that was up, I was in Burke County. The district just went crazy. What do you mean homebound? Well, that means you know. I, I didn't want him in school any longer. I, that way we'd get him out of school. He, you know, he'd be somebody else's problem. Well, we don't have that. Where was the LEA rep? It wasn't there that day. Getting their hair done. Yeah. I mean, you, you've, got to, you've got to protect the district party. The, that's why it says LEA rep. You have to represent the district and because parents are going to advocate for whatever they can get. And teachers are going to go along with whatever's going to be less work on them. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to say, "Wait a minute, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't hire a one-on-one -on -one for this student." Um, you know, I've seen that get written into I when nobody was looking. One-on-one <laughs> -on -one services getting written into an IEP, and then and then somebody said, "We don't have money for that." Well, you do now. It's in the IEP. You know. My suspicion is, is the AP that didn't show up and sign it the next day, there was something that was big money that was, that was decided in her absence. Um, and then she just signed off as a matter of course and probably signed off on something like homebound or one-on-one, -on -one, which is quite expensive. Um, and the other thing too, Dr. Lamb, is the fact that uh, the IEP is a legal document and can and will be used in court. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Well, I didn't know the LEA had to, was supposed to do all that because it's different in my district. Well, that we're telling you what the law is now. Yeah. You know, I know that, that things were carried out differently in a lot of different districts. As I said, I worked in four in my career. Um, but when push comes to shove, the law is the law. And, and you could be doing it a certain way for 100 years, but when you get sued and you have to go to court, that, that that you inherited it that way or that it's always been done that way is immaterial. Uh, the law is the law. Again, as I tell you every week, it's all fun and games till somebody gets their eye put out. Then there's going to be trouble when we have to go to court. 
um, that you've always done it that way. Um, and, and districts many times are willing to take that risk. They know that they are not, they are not complying with the letter of the law, but they're simply willing to take the risk. You know, I had a, I worked in one of the, one of the rural districts that I worked in in Western North Carolina. We had a finance person there who had come to us from, um, what was known at that time as the Western Carolina Center. It's now known as the Maynard J. Iverson Center. Uh, it's for handicapped children and adults in the Western capital, Morganton, North Carolina, which is the Western, the, the, you know, the school for the deaf is there, the insane, you know, the hospital for the mentally and criminally insane is there. Uh, the handicap, the Western Carolina center was there and, and he had, he had worked there at the, at, at Western Carolina center as their finance person before he came to the school district. And he used to say all the time, we're not doing that. You're just going to have to sue us. It's cheaper. It's cheaper for us to go to court than it is to provide that service. I know we're supposed to, but just sue us. He was used to that. And some districts look at it that way is we're going to provide what we're going to provide until you make us do otherwise. But you don't want to be the, 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 the again, you don't want to be the little dog in the scenario here. Um, you know, Boss yells at the man at work. Man comes home, yells at his wife. Wife yells at the kid, and kid, kid's got nobody to yell at, so he turns around and kicks the dog. Uh, as AP, LEA rep, you are the dog in that scenario. Um, you don't want to be that person who gets kicked. Uh, so you need to have your head up, my eyes open. And if you go through these documents tonight, you ought, you ought to survive it. I'm five minutes past our time. I apologize. Hope everybody has had a good week. Let me see. Yeah. Um, week seven coming up. Holidays coming up pretty soon as well. Let's see. What's next Wednesday? Is next Wednesday the actual 4th of July? We'll be here. <laughs> Hope you can join us. If not, I'll record it. Um, I'm taking we're doing that we're doing our fourth of July celebration on the seventh on Saturday. So uh, we don't get any weeks off during during um, summer. We don't we have to provide ten lessons. And so I'll be here. If you're smart, you won't. You'll you'll watch the recorded one later on. So it'll be brief next week as since you probably won't be here with me. Let's see, we got fifteen tonight. Let's see how many we have next week. But I'll see you if not next week, the week following. Everybody have a good week. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hi everybody. Good night. Stop share.